I know. You had um, so many handouts last week, I thought I would uh, spare you uh, this week uh, from the handouts. But, all right. Hi, Jay. So I have hot and I have cold. I took my coat off. How many of you are freezing? Yeah, we, the, the church went into air conditioning mode and we haven't got back into heat mode and we're too afraid to allow that to happen because, oh, I don't know, when you're working with a 50-year-old system, you don't want to play around with it too much. So, uh, yeah, it may not go back to air conditioning. We've had that. And then, you, then all of a sudden we have uh, a bill of... of uh, $6,000 just to make it back to air conditioning. So, we're not doing it, Paul. Okay. We're just going to be cold. Wear your jackets. Um, yeah, see? If, are we online? Hey, everybody. We're cold in this building here tonight. It's a good thing you're uh, sitting at home um, and you are... Uh, how many of you have a cup of coffee? Raise your hand, virtual place, if you've got a cup of coffee. Yes, I see you. Right, good job. We've, how many in here have a cup of coffee? Yeah, I've, yes, a cup of coffee. No, dude, well, there's a reason why I told you about that tonight. <clears throat> We're going to Laodicea. Mr. J, would you, uh, James, would you close the doors? Thank you, my friend. Now, this is the last night and, um, of forever, and <laughs> forever. This is the last time we're going to have May 5. This is the last time, May 5, 2021, we are going to be together. It's just, it's, a, it's an emotional thing. Um, who knows the soundboard? All right, will you hold the left button? Find my button and pull me down. It's on the far left side. Just a tad. Thank you, Brian. Uh, yes, that's it. That's it. Perfect. That's good. Um, when I hear my own self and I reverberate in my chest, then I know I'm, it's a little bit too loud. We, um, Cinco de Mayo. Anybody know what, that, what that's about? You're a, you're a science teacher, right? Do you know any history? Yeah, Mexican independence from who? From France. Yeah. And some other European contingencies. Um, um, and so I got a call from Mexico today. And Andres called, and uh, they're having a huge party, and wanted to know if we were celebrating Cinco de Mayo. And I said no, but I could hear, I could hear in Mexico, it's a big party, and he was having fun. So they really do. I, I think it's just an opportunity to drink beer and stuff like that. That's what I think it is. Because I don't think I don't think they even know what it means, but it's just an opportunity. <clears throat> what are the things that just set you on fire? The Cinco de Mayo set you on fire? I don't know. I think it just could be just an opportunity to party. What sets you on fire? That's kind of what we're talking about tonight. The official title is "Making a Transformational Difference in the Lives of People in." our spheres of influence or in spheres of influence. Um, we we're going to just talk about um, how do we actually, without being, go to, go to school and, and uh, become a Bible scholar and blah, blah, blah. How do we make a transformational difference? That means because we are in a certain sphere, People in that sphere experience the transforming work of the kingdom of God in their lives. 
How does that happen to us? Does that only happen to extroverts? No, it doesn't. And I think, I think introverts, there are reasons for introverts to exist. Isn't that right, Paul? Yes. There are good reasons. And, and you're a living example, right? You, you can tell when an introvert, when you say their name, they, they turn red. No, right? I won't do that to you anymore. But that's what, that's what we need. We need all kinds of people. And it doesn't matter who you are. You can make a transformational difference for the kingdom of heaven in your sphere. Today we're going to talk about some inspirational ways for that to happen. And then some pr practical ways, spiritual practical ways for that to happen as praying people. Um, before we go, any comments or statements, this being our last uh, gathering ever together, um, any, any statements or questions or comments um, about this course? I have one comment coming into tonight, and I'll share with you that comment that I agreed with. Um, but any, any before I get to that. Did you hear what she said? She was encouraged to, to start a new habit, to go outside in the hallway, outside of your kids' bedrooms, and pray for them in the morning. Do you do that every day, once a week? Or? School day? Okay. What have you experienced because of that? What's been the benefit? You feel peace about them going from your house out into the, into the world, the shifting world. Have you noticed anything being uh, married to Ellie? Um, because she's been doing that? Uh, I've noticed a lot of things. Yes. <laughs> this wasn't an open ended question. This was a specific question because Ellie is going into the hallway outside your kids. <laughs> Sure. It is. Yeah. Confidence is probably a good word. Did you? Yeah. Awesome. When you pray about things like that, at, afterwards you have a reason to praise God together, right? Because you know that God had a hand in it because you invited him in. That's awesome. Any other comments? How many, just show of hands, that this course has helped you to understand how you can become more of a praying person? Yeah. What are some of the ways that you would say you are opening up or understanding more or your heart has changed or even your habits have changed to become more of a praying person? Anybody want to comment on that? Okay. 
So we'll just go tell the virtual group that um, she had vertigo and her husband prayed over her and it went away quickly or you fell asleep very fast and you were able to wake up and it was while you went to, you were able to go to sleep and the nausea didn't keep you awake it's awesome anyone else A dad praying with his kids before he drops his kids off at daycare, and there had been positive reaction from the daycare workers. That's awesome. Any other practical becoming praying people things that you've noticed in your own lives? Gail? Gail? There is some there is a spiritual revival happening, yeah. Yeah, Good. Uh, just an awareness and a dependence on the Holy Spirit in the last year in ways that he hasn't experienced necessarily in church before. James. Well I'm saying you're sorry, um, you don't know these people because you're not watching them, but I his name is a uh, uh, Freddie. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Right. Yeah. You know, I, um, somebody said that to me a couple of weeks ago, something very similar from this class. That has anybody else um, um, had that kind of, it's kind of a light bulb going off. You know what? I'm not just going to pray for my will, but I'm going to participate in your will and in, in how to do this and what you may want to do. So I'm going to join you in your will and pray. I've had an, a, a, a few of you actually have talked to me about that. Yeah, that's significant. Any others? We don't have to make anything up. We're just, um, but uh, hopefully, all of you, maybe this has happened to you. Instead of just trying harder, you've prayed. Could that be possible? Or instead of going into a si situation feeling perhaps hopeless, you've prayed and you've had hope. Or perhaps instead of just grinding every day going to work, you've stopped, you've prayed. Or if you've had a relationship issue and you've prayed over it instead of fretting over it. How many would say that you've prayed over a relationship issue um, in the last seven weeks that prior to this you wouldn't have necessarily prayed over? Yeah, yes, that, that has happened. And um, I've had, um, I've had, especially one of our um, virtual watchers, he, a whole small group is watching from another state tonight. And uh, 
one of those people said that they were having such conflict that they began to pray over all the people that they were having conflict with in their um, circle and um, begin to see a shift in those relationships. Fantastic. Um, becoming praying people. And I, wouldn't, it, wouldn't it be cool if someone was talking about, talking about Greg Miller and, and they were just talking about him and he, Greg overheard them and they said, oh yeah, he's that praying guy. Well, Greg is a praying guy, so I, we know that about him already. But, but wouldn't it be cool to hear that? Yeah, well, that's that praying dude. How many would say um, that would be something I would like to be associated with my name? I would like to be known as that praying person. Yes. Um, hopefully, this course, is, that's been my goal, is for us to be becoming praying people, for us to be able to see what are different avenues that when we apply being a praying person to it, it shifts the reality of that circumstance. That's been a significant goal. Therefore, I, this hasn't been like um, someone keeps buzzing me. Stop buzzing me! Um, therefore, how many of you were watching and buzzes and somebody's talking to you all the time? Okay. One of the downfalls. One of the reasons, um, it seems like um, there's been a lot of information given you in this course. And another course we'll, we'll need to do, follow up to this, is a praying, a pr actual praying course where we don't, where I'm not just talking about it, but we're actually uh, a laboratory. We're actually engaging. And I had a number of you request that. And um, because we are virtual, and I, and privacy is an issue, uh, it, just, it just did not, and there are uh, anywhere from 50 to 200 people that watch online. Um, there was no way to actually do the laboratory. I did not feel comfortable doing the laboratory for the world to see, right? Um, but we'll figure that out. I, I want us to be able to look at ways to put application to all these different areas of prayer that we've talked about. How many of you would be interested in at least a follow-up laboratory to this course? Okay, so we'll look at scheduling that. Um, tonight, uh, I'd like to start by uh, telling, looking at the idea of being a person of refuge um, when Todd L. is in the room here. Is it okay for me to tell the world your name? It's too late. I already did it. You can look him up. Todd L. Um, and I started to pray in 2012. And uh, another one of uh, the elders at Bridgewood. Because um, um, Todd and I went to a, a, a prayer meeting in California. Or did I just go and you came the next year? Something like that. <laughs> yes, right, that's what it was. And you came um, in California, and uh, we got there, uh, and they said prayer starts tomorrow morning at 5.30 in the morning, and we thought, that's insane. Who, goes, who prays 5.30 in the morning? We were at a Korean church, and they said, well, they have a prayer meeting at 5.30 every morning. And I thought, I've got to find, I've got to see what kind of people do that. So uh, I went at 5.30 the next morning. At one of the days you were there, you went. That, and dude, they, they pressed in. Now, the way they prayed, uh, a cultural thing, they, they have a, a time when they're, it's programmed, but they also have a time where everybody just is in the same room praying out loud at the same time. And God kind of figures out whose voice it is and, and knows how to decipher <laughs> what they're saying, right? That's God's deal. And it's, it's phenomenal. What an experience. So we came back and we said, okay, we're not Korean, Amer Korean-American. We're, we're maybe European-American, but we can do this. 
And so we thought 5.30 was a little early. At least I did. And so we, we started praying at 7 a.m., Monday through Friday. And now we do that. Um, and you can join us in a Zoom call. Uh, we can give you the Zoom address. Or you can be here live. And there's usually um, just as many on Zoom as there are live. <laughs> this morning they were about the same, 50-50. A lot of times there'll be two people here and ten people on Zoom. So, it, but, but you're all invited. You can all experience this. It's not a wild, crazy prayer time. We're all kind of uh, Minnesota nice, right? So, but, but we pursue the Lord. We, we, every day, every day. And one of the things I think one of the guy in the back mentioned, um, the presence of the Holy Spirit, this church. One of the key reasons why we're aware of the presence of the Holy Spirit is because we pray Monday through Friday at 7 a.m. And every day, every day, we speak the name of Jesus. Over. You were there this morning, weren't you? We spoke the name of Jesus this morning, didn't we? Over our city, over our church. We declared either his standard or his banner, his name, his lordship, and his presence over our city. Often we'll go deeper into speaking him over specifics. But we do this every day. We're, we're seeing, we've been seeing a shift. Something's different about this particular church because of that. So the presence-based church, presence-based home. I would dare say that what you've described because of standing in the hallway praying over your kids and praying over your wife, you've made a shift into being a presence-based home. That's what I would call it. Uh, the phrase presence-based uh, came out of my lips for the first time one day after our eighth grader came home from school in the year 2000. There was another kid on the bus who... Um, I wrote this earlier, so I want to read it as, speak it as I wrote it. There was another kid on the bus who saw an opportunity to climb the teenage social ladder of success by bullying our son. And our son's response to it touched my heart. It, he said to me, I thought he was my friend. And then he cried and he said, I would never treat a friend that way. You see, middle, middle school students can be cruel. So I said that to him. I said, son, you're in middle school. Middle school kids can be really cruel. You just need to remember who you are and don't engage in his issues. And for a month, our son suffered the pain of the bully on the bus. And every day when he arrived at home, he was reminded of who he is in Christ and that he does not need to be ruled by another student's dysfunction. What happens to a middle school student, though, who gets bullied on the bus and then comes home to a non-presence-based home where he is unsure of his identity and he's unsure of his security? That poor student suffers on the bus and in a, in a key, impressionable age, he... Um, all the words that are spoken to him sears into his brain life-damaging da conclusions about his own identity and his own abilities that can plague him for the rest of his life, in life. And it is during the middle school years that many children make lifelong decisions about their own identities. As a pastor, I walk through people in their 30s, 40s, and 50s when they're having explosions going off in their psyches from stuff that happened in middle school. And I, I th an explosion will occur. Everyone will experience an explosion from middle school. Now, Christ is the only one that carries it through without damaging you. Just listen to how adults talk about themselves when they say, I'm not a likable person, or I would never be able to do that. That strong feeling probably came from a decision made in middle school. Middle school students need to come home 
to a presence-based home, a home where there is a healthy marriage, consistent love and discipline, predictable schedules, reasonable barriers to unhealthy media influences, and solid, secure relationships, an obvious presence of the Holy Spirit. After watching our middle school son suffer, I realized that I, as a father and as a husband, needed to lead the charge to make our home a present spaced home. We had three more children that still had to go through middle school, three more children who had to face an identity-stealing middle school world. They needed a presence-based home to counteract a shifting, manipulative, and soul-stealing world. They needed a home where they could thrive in their relationships, be secure in love, be solid in their convictions, and be ready to stand against the world. The father of that middle school bully came to me at an event and said, the way your son treated my son blessed my son. His son had been kicked out of high school. But he had mentioned that one of his true friends from that eighth grade year was my son. Interesting, huh? Can you imagine what would happen if 100 homes in this region made a decision to make their home a presence-based home? If each home had two children, that would mean 200 children had a secure, healthy, encouraging, balanced house to go home to every day. That would mean that those children did not have to endure a shifting, unstable, predatory world by themselves. They would always have a presence-based home to go to. Also, 200 children would be a lesser risk, at a lesser risk, for falling prey to the tragic, life-stealing dangers that middle school has to offer. One, our imaginations can go even deeper. Every one of these children have neighbors and friends. Every child goes to school. Every child has the opportunity for sports or music or church or a myriad of things. Imagine the influence these presence-based homes will have on all those with whom those children interact. One child, one secure child in his or her identity, one loved child, one child with healthy motivations can have a profound effect upon other children. One presence-based home can be transformational for a whole neighborhood, a whole school, a whole church, a whole soccer team, a whole scrapbook club, a whole fishing excursion, a whole region. Now I had to make this adaptable to Minnesota, of course. A whole region. Presence-based. This happens in our homes by being people of the Holy Spirit. By being people where the Holy Spirit is present, obviously present. Being praying people. And our homes become presence-based homes. See, people are looking for something to stable to grab onto. And maybe you, maybe your children, Maybe you're that something stable. You are. You are that something stable. To become a praying person is to become that which others grab onto. That stability. That's you. This is from Revelation 3. Uh, Jesus speaking through the Apostle John. And uh, telling the church in Laodicea, I don't want neither hot nor cold. I drink my hot, but I'm working on my cold. You are neither hot nor cold, and you are lukewarm. I spit you from my mouth. I'm going to not spit on anybody. But then he says this, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich. Laodicea was a rich place. And white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness. And salve to put on your eyes so you can see. So he's saying to them, look, you have everything. 
But you really have nothing. You are, you have shameful nakedness. Unless you have clothing from heaven. Unless you are clothed with the Holy Spirit. Salve, presence, touchable Holy Spirit, touchable salve. The actual working presence of the Holy Spirit on your eyes. That's what that is. So you can actually see. So you don't react to each other all the time. You don't react to your children all the time. You see. So you don't, you don't talk about people in your home so that kids learn how to diss others. Or you don't tear down your boss so your kids learn how to be rebellious. Or you don't go home from church on Sunday morning and talk about how a horrible pastor is so that the kid grows up and doesn't want to go to church. How many of you grew up with that? You're not raising your hands because you want to be nice. But I know you did. White clothes. Now here's an extreme story. It's about Maximilian Kolbe. He's a priest. He wore the beautiful white clothes given him by the Lord. Let me just read a little bit to you. Maximilian Kolbe was a man who wore the beautiful white clothes given to him by Jesus. The Lord got hold of this young man in Poland called him to be a Catholic priest in 1939. Colby found himself in the middle of a horrible movement of the Nazis into Poland. Never thinking of himself, Colby led his Franciscan friary in Warsaw to care for and shelter 3,000 refugees of war. 2,000 of them were Jews. And it wasn't long before the Nazis seized Maximilian Kolbe and put him into the death camp at Auschwitz. While in Auschwitz, Kolbe continued to wear his white robes, his white clothes of the presence of the Holy Spirit. It, he happened to be a priest, but you don't need to be a priest to wear it. Jesus expected everybody in the church of Laodicea to put white robes on. The presence-based life. Prayer-filled people people in relationship, people anointed. And so uh, he ministered to other inmates, always bringing them the love of Jesus. Most of them were Jewish. So while he, when he was beaten by the Nazis, he never cried out. Instead, he prayed for his tormentors while he was being beaten. And so his beatings became less. One day after one of the prisoners of Auschwitz attempted to escape, the commandant gathered all the prisoners and said that 10 men had to die because of the escape attempt. Uh, Francis, you would know how to say this, the Yuginalskis, but I don't know how to say his name. Was, huh? Dude, that's a Galjanet, Kajanicek, Kajanicek was one of the 10 men chosen to die. And when, when Francis was grabbed by the soldiers, he cried out, my poor wife, my poor children, what will they do? Hearing this, Father Colby immediately stepped in and said, I'm a Catholic priest, let me take his place. I am old, he has a wife and children. So Colby ministered to the other nine as they were starved to death. He led them in hymns, ministered to their pain, he was the last to die of the ten, but the reports are that he died with a look of peace. Now that's an extreme example of wearing white clothes. First to, die, first to, first to volunteer for death, last to die. First to volunteer with peace, last to die with peace. Presence-based that the world does not rule who you are. Christ rules who you are. So to become a praying person, to become a presence-based person, is to be wearing clothes that radiate who you are, who rules your heart, who rules your mind, who rules your emotions, who rules your actions, who rules your, rules your will. And your clothes reflect 
the rulership, the royalty of the presence of God in you. This is a radical presence in Maximilian Kolbe. But radical presence is just simply putting God's presence in every situation. And in today's world, that is radical. Isaiah 64, verses 1 and 2. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains would tremble before you, as when fire sets twigs ablaze and causes water to boil. Come down to make your name known to your enemies. Cause the nations to quake before you. Look at that verse 2. As when the fire sets twigs ablaze. Fire. Fire. Fire is in the Old Testament and New Testament. We're going to look at some passages. as evidence of the Holy Spirit's presence. Humanity has, uh, has tried to figure out ways to keep um, God from being present. We, uh, we would prefer that God stays up in heaven. Um, we live like we would prefer God to stay there. Even our prayers. I, I was with people praying today, and I, I heard this prayer, and I thought, nah, that's a prayer that comes out of Christian tradition. I don't know that it's a prayer based on the presence of God. He said, God, help us to. And then God, help us to. And God, help us to. And I wanted to stop him and say, stop doing that. This isn't the responsibility of all this life is not on our shoulders. God doesn't say to us, okay, here's the Bible. Go make it happen. A presence-based person cooperates with the Holy Spirit who goes before him. And it's a different kind of prayer. The whole world doesn't rest on our shoulders. We belong to him. We do this with him. God, we join you. Lord, we choose. That would be a different kind of prayer. God, we choose to join you as you do this work, as you go before us, as you are our rear guard. We choose to yield to you. Have your way in us. Do this work. Do this work before us. You can hear how we pray. People who wear white clothes, people who are set afire, we're not just doing this on our own. You can hear other prayers like, Lord, heal this situation, blah, 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 if it be your will at the end. And it's not a bad prayer. We don't have healing unless it's the will of God. But the prayer may mean that we don't truly believe that God has a will concerning it, and it's a cop-out in case it doesn't happen. We, people who wear white clothes, who are cooperating with the Holy Spirit in this life, Joining the Father. You've been here the last few weeks. You've seen that God wants to catch us up in his will. So the prayer is, Lord, show me how to speak your will into this situation and join you in your will. What kind of healing do you want to do here? And we can go into every expectation that God the Father has will for healing. May not be exactly what the need before us is, but he has will for transformation in that person's life. How can I join him in this? To be person covered in white, you are led and cooperate with the Holy Spirit. So John was a, um, oh, another, another way that we, we pray with other clothes on, with not white clothes on, but with human, just human clothes on, is when we forget that we're actually praying to God and we, and we teach others in our prayer. And people learn how to pray by going to church and listening to sermons. And the pastors, and I've done this, I think I did it two weeks ago. Um, and at the end of it, I went, dude, I just did that. I, I, I gave all the points of my sermon at, as a conclusion in my prayer so that you would remember it. Do you remember me doing that a couple weeks ago? I thought, Oops. I do that too. Prayers are not sermons for others to hear. 
Um, may we always, blah, 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 blah. Lord, may we, blah, blah, blah. Help them to, blah, 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 blah. We join the Holy Spirit in what he wants to do. We don't need to preach to people. We need to join the powerful movement of God and what he's doing. God, we ask that right now you would move with fire. Would you break into, would you shift, would you heal, would you saturate? What's, what verbal picture do you need to join the Lord in for him to do? work that you're joining him in by speaking into the place. Not just preaching to the people around you. Wearing white clothes means you are caught up in the presence of the Holy Spirit for what he wants to accomplish. John was a medical student. Um, He was a a wealthy family. He had a heart condition. Um, He was... uh, he was going to die unless God intervened. And I prayed. I prayed fervently. I got the elders. We all prayed hard. Um, and John died. And um, the parents reacted very vehemently against God and angry at me and angry at the elders that we would even give an expectation that perhaps John would live, that God would heal him. And the elders, um, to a man, came to me in their own suffering. And they told me that they did not want me as a pastor to pray for healing any longer in these types of situations or on Sundays because it gave false hope to people because God doesn't work that way anymore. Oops. Now, I really struggled, first in great suffering because John died, then with the thought that John was totally fine in heaven. And he's saying to us, hey, things are great. (laughs) I'm so glad I died. I'm so glad glad I'm here, you know. Keep praying for people. I could almost hear John saying that to me as a pastor. Just because I died, don't stop praying for people, Pastor Dave. I remember having this picture of him and said, don't stop praying healing. And then also because I was struggling because I'm not God. And I watched, I've watched God actually heal cancer. I've, I've watched tumors shrink in front of my eyes. I've watched broken bones straighten, backs straighten. Uh, I've seen ears open eyes heal, livers, kidneys, hearts, back in rhythm. I was praying over a man in, with a virus, and the doctors were stepping back. I forget the name of the virus that went through the Midwest and years ago. And, and I, I watched him get up. And walk out of the room and go home by the transformational power of God. I watched him. But I also watched a young girl die because God wasn't going to heal her. I don't know why God chose to not heal John, but that does not mean we are not to pray healing as a people, as a pastor, as a church. We must be people of the presence of God and join him in his will. And sometimes it's going to be uncomfortable. And sometimes he's going to put a fire in our bellies to pray a certain way. And that doesn't happen the way we think. But it doesn't matter. Being people dressed in white means that we are going to do what God calls us to do. We're going to speak no matter if we are extrovert or introvert, we're going to speak out loud the will of God that to speak into a specific situation, we're going to go into any situation with the courage and the strength, the presence of the Holy Spirit. 
because the Holy Spirit is a fiery presence. This isn't just a time for the church to get people saved. This is a time for us to participate in the kingdom of heaven where our king is ruling in our region and lives in our region are touched through us. This isn't just about getting people growing a church, making a mega church, or having a lot of baptisms. This is about the transformation of, of the region we're in for the kingdom of heaven. And because that happens, lives are saved and families are transformed. As when fire sets twigs ablaze. Fire setting twigs ablaze. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, fire was a sign of the Holy Spirit's presence throughout Scripture. Um, Moses, the burning bush, it's God's presence. God's present glory in uh, Shekinah glory is a present glory. Uh, that is expressed in Exodus as a pillar of cloud by day and a burning a pillar at night. Um, the cloud covering the temple in the Old Testament uh, was, was a, cl- a cloud with a fire and, and, and smoke. Fire as an instrument of God's judgment. Uh, God's fire surrounded people because they were complaining in, in Numbers 11. Fire is a sign of God's power. In Judges 13, an angel appeared before Samson's parents in fire. Fire shows God's presence in the, teb- in the temple involved in offerings. The fire of the lanterns of his presence in the, not the most holy place, but the holy place just outside the inner sanct- inner, inner tabernacle is the uh, lampstand of the presence, the burning fire and presence of the Holy Spirit. In the New Testament, see, as the fire of the Holy Spirit's presence was, was light and a guide to Israel, the presence of God in the temple, the Holy Spirit now has made the temple right here in our hearts. Here, the Holy Spirit burns in his presence to light our path, to guide us to live as his children. Individually, Jesus says to everybody in the church at Laodicea, get your white clothes on. He would say it to the nation of Israel, you are the people clothed with fire. Now he says it individually to every one of you. Get your white clothes on. Be people of the presence. God's presence burns within us, uh, as it did in Acts 4, 31, with the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. It's like God's burning within them when uh, Jesus revealed himself after he re- rose from the dead. God's presence burns as a fire upon us, so it's within us and then upon us. Uh, at Pentecost, with the disciples had tongues of fire come on them. You see, the Holy Spirit and fire go together within us and upon us. This is how uh, uh, Matthew writes in Matthew 3. John the Baptist says, I baptize you with water for repentance. And then Jesus says, but after me will come one. John says this, but after me will come one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not fit to carry. He will baptize you, referring to Jesus, with the Holy Spirit and with fire. These are radiant, burning, white clothes. If you're a believer in Jesus, you can't escape the fire. That's why we're not to quench the Holy Spirit, Paul says. Do not quench the Holy Spirit. Uh, Don't throw the world's water on your clothing. You're burning white radiant clothing of the presence. To become a praying person is to be a present-based person. Have a present-based home. Have a presence-based church. As when a fire sets twigs ablaze, Isaiah 64, verse 2. 
This is transformation from within. So in, this is talking about uh, pruning a, a bush. A, a, a typical vin, vine, grapevine, has 50 to 60 shoots that need to be pruned prior to a pruning. After the pruning, in order for that vine to be ready to grow as many fruit as possible, they leave like five shoots. So they cut off 45 to 55, and it's from those five shoots that the fruit grows. This is a fire setting twigs ablaze. Twigs, all 45 to 55 of those shoots are burned. They're burned away. The dead wood that, that, that would keep you from bearing all this fruit, God wants to burn it away. That's what the Spirit of God does. He burns away that which is not from God in us. That's why we need to be presence-based people. How does he do this? Well, he burns away distractions from God's mission in our hearts. We are so distracted from what God wants to do in our lives. We have so many other plans. Have you ever stopped to think, God, what do you want to do? Well, the Holy Spirit wants to burn away those distractions. Uh, he wants to burn away sins in our lives and, al and uh, alignments with other things that are not from God. He wants to burn away relationships that are destructive to his will in our lives. If you've got a relationship that is, that is an addictive relationship that is destructive to God's work in your life, let the Holy Spirit have it because he will burn that away. He wants to burn away ideologies that minimize God in our lives. If we are so set on our ideologies and they are contradictory to the word of God, he wants to burn that stuff away. He wants to burn away decisions and commitments that we've made that minimize who God is. So that we can bear fruit from within. But then he also wants to come upon, and this is the last slide. As the Holy Spirit comes upon us with our white clothes, in the Old Testament, he came upon specific people for specific purposes at specific times. In the New Testament, he comes upon us for specific people, for specific purposes at specific times. But he comes upon every one of us, not just specific. First Corinthians 12, we read, to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit. In Ephesians 1 verse 3, we read that uh, in Christ we are given every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 5, verse 18, where we hear Paul saying to us, do not be drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery, but be filled, every one of you, be filled continually. The verbiage is, be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. In 1 Peter 4, uh, Peter says to us, uh, you will speak uh, serve with the power, the strength that only God gives, and you will speak the very words of God. Presence. Within transforming you, presence coming upon you for specific purposes at specific times for lives around you to be transformed. white clothes because of the burning presence of the Holy Spirit. I guarantee as you put these clothes on, you will see the transforming power of God in the lives of your family, in the lives of your people at work, your children, your ministries, your spheres of influence. That's what our Lord does. Lord, I ask that you would bring an anointing of your presence upon and within. Make us presence-based people of prayer. Wearing the white clothes that come through 
the saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the presence of the Holy Spirit. God, we yield to you. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Thank you, virtual audience. We'll see you later.